Ransom for a Dead Man. Here we have our official pilot episode for Columbo. It first aired on March 1st, 1971, almost exactly three years after the TV movie Prescription Murder. This episode was written and produced by Dean Hargrove, who wrote four Columbo episodes and produced 20 of them. And it was directed by Richard Irving, who we already know about because he directed Prescription Murder. Now, as a reminder before we get going here, this video is going to be loaded with spoilers. The best way to watch Columbo is to just watch Columbo. This video is intended to be supplementary to the original episode. We're going to be summarizing the whole story, analyzing, and noticing things that you may not have noticed on your first viewing. And here we have our opening scene of a woman constructing a ransom letter. No need for gloves, of course. This woman happens to be our villain, named Leslie Williams. She is played by Lee Grant, who is known for her role in The Heat of the Night, as well as Damien, Omen 2, and also playing Felicia in 1975's film Shampoo, in which she won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. We quickly learn here that she is educated in the tape splicing world, and this episode enjoys its stylized headlights, which I do too. Plants and Statues. This will be a common sight throughout the Columbo series. This unsuspecting man's name is Paul Williams. He is played by Harlan Ward, who has made a huge variety of TV appearances, several of those appearances being in Dragnet, You Are There, Fury, The Rifleman, Perry Mason, The Virginian, The Big Valley, The FBI, Bonanza, and as well as a long list of other uncredited roles. Man, that's gotta be so much more satisfying to burn your junk mail. Well, as Mr. Paul stands up, he sees Leslie. Well, Leslie, I thought... And she just shoots the poor fella. Maybe it's just me, but I think this guy could be Nick Cave's uncle or something. Anyway, he's dead now. It's not common in later Columbo episodes for a murder to happen without some sort of buildup or motive given for the crime. Take note of this interior, because we just might see it again in the future. I don't think this ever happens again in Columbo, but we are given the perspective of the victim here. So, now that we saw the trunk shut and she's slightly out of breath, we suppose she must have drugged Paul from the house, lifted him into the trunk. Adrenaline must be giving her that super strength she needed to get this job done. They are sure to have us see her move her seat forward. The fantastic music is composed by Billy Goldenberg. He is responsible for the music in seven Columbo episodes. Now we get to see Leslie show off her lack of having any kind of heart, besides the part where she shoots her husband. Kicks his bagged body off a cliff, and now she's shooting us her dagger eyes. Now to deliver the ransom letter. At least she's got gloves on. Hello, Pat! So now Leslie calls up somebody named Pat, asking them to call her at the office tomorrow at 12.15 to remind her of their tennis date. Here she is multitasking or something. Objection. Irrelevant and immaterial. I wish I could say that on a daily basis. The judge here is played by Judson Morgan, whom we will see again in another small part in a future Columbo episode. Judson also played the judge in an episode of The Bold Ones, The Lawyers TV series. And he even played a judge in the Hawkins TV series. Judson has a thing for being the judge. The plaintiff, Mr. Crowell, is played by Bill Walker. He has a very long acting resume with several uncredited roles. And he's known for acting in Big Jake and The Boy Who Caught a Crook. The attorney is played by Hank Brandt, who played in Escape from Alcatraz, also several episodes of Barnaby Jones, The Six Million Dollar Man, Dynasty, and Santa Barbara, as well as playing Carl Swanson in the 1994 film Dumb and Dumber. While Leslie cracks jokes about the plaintiff being lit, the man beside her is named Burt Green. I mention him because he also is uncredited in a couple of future Columbo episodes. He has been in a large collection of roles in movies and TV shows, and all of them are uncredited. So, I'll credit him now. Secretary Nancy here is played by Lisa Moore, who is in several TV shows, but mostly acted in the Medical Center TV series. Leslie's getting set up here in her office with two witnesses for her 1215 phone call from Pat, who is just supposed to say tennis and hang up. Oh, did we forget to talk about Michael here? He's played by John Fink, who is most known for playing Dr. Adam in the Nancy TV series and playing Brian Adams in the Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman TV series. 
Yes. Liz? Now let's hope Pat doesn't have any gossip or news she needs to get out so we can act startled. One word. Tennis. Don't forget. What? Who is this? So you see in movies all the time people hitting the switch hook when they lose connection. I read that when we still had operators ruling the phone lines, hitting the hook multiple times would alert the operator with a flashing light on the switchboard panel. I also read that hitting the hook would sometimes work to restore a disconnected line. But I don't totally understand it all, being born in the late 80s. Although I would like to understand if any of my viewers would like to share their knowledge with me. What is it? You better call the police. That man on the phone said he's got my husband. Alrighty, now the ball is rolling, and there's the ransom note that should be loaded with Leslie's fingerprints. You could argue that her fingerprints are on the ransom letter because she opened the letter herself. Unless she was trying to read the letter with her fingerprints like Braille, that just doesn't make sense. And here we have Agent Carlson, played by Harold Gould, who appeared in Patch Adams, Freaky Friday, and has a huge TV resume with several appearances in the Virginian TV series, The Long Hot Summer, Hogan's Heroes, The FBI, The Feather and Father Gang, Washington Behind Closed Doors, Rhoda, Insight, The Golden Girls. Leslie is curious if they will be able to trace the call. But Carlson says only if the call is long enough. Kidnappers are usually too smart for that which makes Leslie super proud of her setup that is waiting to go off soon. And the doorbell rings, which is really odd that nobody goes with Leslie to the door, because who knows who could be there with her husband being kidnapped and all. Luckily, it's just Columbo, which that's an understatement. And Peter Falk is in his completed Columbo attire and personality. I'm so curious what that doormat says. Is everything all right, Mr. Williams? Lieutenant Columbo's lost his pen. Oh, listen, don't bother him about it. Uh... This looking for a pin thing is the first of many distracting things for criminals to let their guard down because Columbo loves to come off as non-threatening. He does the polite, I don't know any of you, smile and hello. Seems like Columbo's a stranger to everyone else in the room besides Agent Carlson. Turns out Columbo stopped by to let them know they found her husband's car, but they just got the phone call from the police with that information, so I'm curious why Columbo was even sent here, especially being with homicide since no murder has been reported. Here's where we learn that Leslie can fly a plane from Phil, who's played by Jed Allen, who is most known for playing Scott Turner in the TV show Lassie, as well as playing Rush Sanders in Beverly Hills 90210. He lays out the plan about Leslie flying to a certain point on the map and dropping the $300,000 ransom money in a bag. $300,000 in 1971 is worth $1,994,000 today in 2021. Columbo likes checking out background props just as much as I do. This is the room where she constructed the ransom letter. Columbo asks where the bathroom is. She gives him instructions on how to get there and then asks if he understands as if he is a three-year-old. Have you got that? First door on your right. Agent Carlson comes over to give some encouragement to Leslie and she starts batting her eyelashes at him, which takes him slightly off guard. Columbo returns from the restroom and he compliments her house. Then he mentions lemon-shaped soap. Well, I was almost afraid to use them. If you don't mind my asking, when you use one and you put it back in the plate, how do you keep it from sticking to the others? Me being a soap maker, yes, I make soap, I think this little story is funny. I haven't made any lemon-shaped soaps yet, but I think I'll put that on my list of future projects. Then Leslie changes the subject, saying she is going to fix dinner, which flickers on a light bulb for Columbo, because where are the servants? Then we cut to Leslie's office, where her little contraption is set up that she was preparing at the beginning of the episode. They want $300,000. When? Tomorrow night. Just follow instructions. Paul. Paul! Looks like that went smoothly. Time for the emotional outburst. I'm not going to take any chances with my husband's life! By the way, the man on the far left is named Richard, who is played by Charles McCulley. We may be seeing his face again in a couple future Columbo episodes. While we're here, let's mention this blonde fella, Hammond. He's played by Paul Carr, who had several TV appearances on Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, The Virginian, and Mannix. Columbo is in real deep thought about the whole scene that just played out. He calls her a unique woman which is a gentle way of saying her behavior was pretty odd. Anyway, now it's a new day, and we have gathered up the $300,000 of ransom money. This guy here, Perkins, is played by Richard Rote. 
he's been in tons of TV shows, some including the FBI, Hill Street Blues, and Dynasty. I'm glad Columbo's still here, but I don't really understand why he's here. Leslie was sure to have the ransom money placed in a bag she is providing. Now we have teleported to her room with the bag of money. The FBI guys, Columbo, and Leslie. Leslie is reconfirming that they are going to stay far away from her when she makes the drop because, you know, she is concerned about her husband's life. And then everyone leaves Leslie alone in the room with the ransom money so she can change her outfit. Very strange. Well, it looks like she wanted to dress like the bag, I guess. So Agent Carlson, Hammond, and Columbo get in the helicopter that is going to follow Leslie at a two-mile distance. Now, I read that the song playing during this scene, written by Billy Goldenberg, named it the Columbo theme. Recorded by Nori Paramore and his orchestra, this song didn't ever become a regular song on the show. The Columbo series never had a theme of its own. Here we have a great view of the nightlights of LA. We get to learn something new about Columbo here. He is not too relaxed up in the sky in this helicopter. He's very tense, in fact. Leslie gets a clue to this when she hears over the radio Columbo asking, How much further is it? How much further is it? How much further is it? Now as she approaches the location for the drop, we see Leslie take out a blinking box thing and throws it out the window. What was that for? Well, our good buddy Phil explained that to us earlier, but it was a pretty easy thing to miss without drawing attention to it. Mrs. Williams used to fly alone. I know along this highway. Now there'll be a flashing light signal right about there, and the money's to be dropped in a bag. Usual warnings, no cops. What's this? Throwing an empty bag out of the plane? All right then. It's amazing to me how the cop and the helicopter all land at the spot where the kidnappers supposedly just were and somehow found that empty bag that certainly would have fallen off course for how lightweight it was. But besides that, the kidnappers gave strict instructions that no cops are to be involved and here they are crawling all over the place with flashlights and loud helicopters. What were they thinking? Columbo looks at the bag and is so puzzled by this. They get back to the airport. Columbo is really suspicious about the whole situation now. He's going to check out Leslie's locker. It's pretty impressive that he can open a padlock just by listening. I've tried that, and I couldn't do it. Nothing to find in the locker, unfortunately. Just a big old jug of perfume. The scene switches to Leslie arriving home from the drop with white bag in hand. She's got a secret compartment in her oversized closet. That's pretty cool. After locking up and closing the closet, she turns around and... Whoa, that sight would have startled anyone. Turns out this is her stepdaughter. She was in school overseas in Zurich and immediately flew back to California after hearing the news of her father's kidnapping. We also quickly learn that these two do not get along. I hate you as much as you hate me. Maybe more. The stepdaughter's name is Margaret, and she's played by Patricia Maddock, who appeared in The Beguiled and this episode of Columbo, as well as making appearances in a few other TV shows. The next morning, Margaret is watching TV, and what just happens to be on is a movie called Double Indemnity. This is a film noir crime drama about a seductive housewife getting hold of an insurance man. The wife proposes to kill her husband to receive the proceeds of an accident insurance policy, and the insurance guy devises a scheme to receive twice the amount based on a double indemnity clause. If you enjoy movies, I totally recommend Double Indemnity. It's directed by Billy Wilder, and while you're at it watching Double Indemnity, I suggest checking out some of Billy Wilder's other films that he's directed. Leslie seems a little annoyed about her watching this. Margaret is wondering why there's no mention of her father's kidnapping in the paper. Leslie explains that they're keeping it out of the press and off the television. Now Margaret wants to know where is Leslie going today? Which she says she's going to work. Margaret cannot understand how she could possibly go to work under the circumstances. Someday when you take on responsibilities, you'll find out that you don't always have a choice, that you have to function no matter what. Switching scenes to Leslie's courtroom date. She's giving instructions to a lady to cry about everything when she's being cross-examined. Especially when he asks you how fast you were going when you hit their car. Very interesting legal advice there. Agent Carlson and Columbo rush into the room with some dreadful news. Your husband is dead, Mrs. Williams. Here's her interesting fainting spell. 
Now Columbo watches this and finds it really odd. Leslie never asked where they found her husband or how he was killed. He also mentions that before this, she was very cool and collected until now. Although, I think that if she just learned her husband was dead, she has every right to be a little extra emotional. Agent Carlson is getting the hints that Columbo is a bit suspicious of Leslie, which ruffles Carlson's feathers, causing him to start threatening Columbo with talking to their superiors about him. But Columbo reminds Carlson where his place is and that he'd better stay there. This is not just a kidnapping. This is a murder now, and I kind of figure that's my department. I'll see you around. We return to Leslie's house, and the whole crew is here. A doctor comes in and lets us all know that he's given Margaret an injection to knock her out, and that these pills are for Leslie to knock her out as well. I can't find any information anywhere on who played the doctor, so if you know, I'd love to hear it. Now that everyone has given Leslie all her sorrowful attention and left, she throws the pills in the fireplace. After all, she'll sleep like a little lamb tonight without them. She seems quite happy and content, humming and twirling about. Then here comes Margaret creeping down the stairs and witnesses her happy stepmother. Now the day of the funeral. Our priest here is played by Richard O'Brien, who is also seen in the Andromeda Strain, the FBI, the Smith Family, the Big Valley, as well as a huge variety of other TV show appearances. Well, it sure is nice of Columbo to attend the funeral. This funeral location is at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, founded in 1899. It is one of the oldest cemeteries in Los Angeles, California, and located on the Santa Monica Boulevard in the Hollywood District. This cemetery has appeared in over 70 different movie and television productions. As the funeral ends and people begin to leave, Margaret jumps up and gives Leslie a good smack in the face and then runs off. Here Columbo's waiting for Margaret to walk by so he could talk to her. Columbo makes sure to let her know that she is not alone and takes her hand. I think he was trying to communicate to her that he wants to know why she told Leslie this is what she wanted before giving her a good one. Back to Leslie's house, Pat is over visiting and talking about Margaret. Pat's advice is to kick her out right now, the day of her father's funeral, without a dime. Another heartless woman. There's a big old golden bearded man statue that I can't identify. Does anyone know who that's supposed to be? Here's an interesting camera angle. I think we're supposed to be in Margaret's viewpoint here. Then Leslie wants to talk to Margaret about her adolescent hysteria scene at the cemetery and that she doesn't want to hear any more sarcasm. Of course. Then she suggests she moves out and goes back to school overseas, but Margaret refuses. Leslie tells her to get a job because they are broke from paying the ransom money. Next morning, we find Columbo in the waiting room at Leslie's office because he has an appointment with her. Michael here is filling in for the secretary that phoned in sick. I don't know how you do it. Do what? Work for a woman. I don't know how he does it either. Michael tries to defend himself by informing Columbo that she is one of the best trial attorneys in the state, as if that changes anything. Columbo lets Leslie know that they haven't come up with any clues on who is responsible for her husband's death. Then Columbo notices her fancy pants telephone gadget. He's really interested in it, and Leslie foolishly goes over there and explains how the thing works. This isn't the last time these super clever murderers use a phone for their alibi. Columbo innocently takes down the name of the phone machine thing. Then he begins talking about how he is strange and a worrier, and his wife says he can be a pain with all his worrying. Leslie behaves totally uninterested and asks him to get on with whatever he wants to talk about. And there's another one of those grenade-sized lighters. Columbo starts sharing things that are troubling. The ransom money bag, for instance. He mentions it's very funny that a criminal would take all the money out of the bag and leave the bag. Which is true, that's very odd. Leslie tries to give her a little explanation of why the criminal would do that, and Columbo likes to pretend that she's probably right. He says he's trying to use the bag example to show her what kind of a person he is and how details bother him. He's trying to show her a whatchamacallit of his, a, uh... An idiosyncrasy. Right. Idiosyncrasy, which is defined as a mode of behavior or way of thought peculiar to an individual. Gee, that's a, that's a good word. Oh, one of the best. And then they admire the word for a few seconds. Before he's about to leave, he remembers he wants to mention the angle of the bullet and that the killer was probably sitting and her husband was probably standing when he was shot, which makes him think the killer and her husband know each other. Then Leslie starts getting a little disturbed by this and needs some water. Columbo mentions another peculiar thing. Paul was shot with a 22 caliber revolver, which is smaller than what most criminals use. Columbo figures the killer wanted to make sure the bullet didn't go all the way through Paul, 
and into the wall to eliminate evidence in the room. She acts like nothing significant is being said here, and he states that this kidnapping just does not add up. Columbo wants to chat with her a little more about her husband to try to find somebody who could be significant to this case. Leslie agrees to visit with him, but it will be in her airplane. She already has an idea that he doesn't like flying from the ransom money drop, so she must figure she can keep him too distracted to ask the good questions. We get to see some really cool aerial shots here, and we get to watch Leslie do a loop to stir up Columbo. Columbo is getting really unsettled indeed. She then insists he take control and try to fly the plane. She hands over the controls and now he has no choice but to take them. And she starts talking about how you treat a plane like you treat a woman, which is a slightly odd thing to say. Then she takes back the controls and Columbo is very distressed. So while we have these two in the cockpit together, let's talk about them a little bit. Peter Falk and Lee Grant co-starred in the Broadway production of The Prisoner of Second Avenue. This was a 1971 Neil Simon play. Before that production, they also co-starred in a 1963 film called The Balcony, which is an adaptation of Jean Genet's 1957 play of the same name. Watching them in this scene together, they seem really comfortable with each other as actors. So anyway, once Columbo is ready to start talking again, after being so shook up from the flying a plane experience, he begins asking Leslie about her husband's personality and if he had any enemies or relationships with other women. We learn her husband was a very decent man with strong morals. And now here they have landed and are coming to a stop with a lovely California mountain range behind the plane. Whoa, where'd that building come from? And that building! Then Columbo starts visiting about his cousin Ralph. And I love this monologue about Ralph. It is so funny to me. You know, I have this cousin, Ralph. His name is Ralph. Ralph was the greatest at everything. Ralph was the greatest. I mean, Ralph. That Ralph was something. I'll tell you that. I'll never forget him. Columbo bringing up experiences or stories from his relatives becomes very common in later episodes. Whether or not these relatives are real is debatable. Anyway, Leslie asks Columbo if there's a point to this story. And Columbo says that when she was talking about her husband on the plane, it reminded him of Ralph. Ralph was a bore and so perfect that there are times he felt like killing him. This is a really odd story to try to get a response from someone you believe is guilty. But I liked Leslie's response here. Yes, well... Now here we switch scenes to Barney's Beanery, which is in fact a real place that serves a mean bowl of chili. Located on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. But even though this is a real place, the scene filmed inside is not Barney's Beanery. We get to see that Columbo is an ace at playing pool. I wish I could share something about the two guys playing pool with him, but I couldn't find anything. I'm really digging the plant ceiling, though. Now we get to learn what Columbo's favorite food is. What'll it be? I'll have the chili bird. The man playing Bert here is Timothy Carey. You'll find him in two of Stanley Kubrick's films, The Killing and Paths of Glory, as well as starring in a film he produced, wrote, and directed himself called The World's Greatest Sinner. We'll get to see him again a couple times in future Columbo episodes. Then Margaret walks in and it takes Columbo a moment to even recognize who she is. Her face isn't memorable enough, I guess. Bert slams the ketchup down for Columbo, but he just pushes it away. No ketchup in his chili. So Margaret is here because she has something she needs to tell Columbo about her father's murder, but she wants to move to a booth. Notice Columbo gathers all his food as well as a portfolio of some sort. Well. Where'd that portfolio go? Margaret goes on to say she believes her stepmother definitely had something to do with her father's murder. She said he came to visit her in Switzerland and confessed to her that he had been a fool and that Leslie demanded he quit his law practice and hand it over to her and that she only wanted to share the house and keep up appearances but not truly be husband and wife. Columbo explains that even though she may have a motive, that's not good enough. You have to have proof. Columbo does mention that the seat of her father's car had been moved forward as if someone shorter than her father was driving it, as well as never finding the car keys and the killer likely still has them. Scene transitioning to Leslie taking a nap and Margaret calling up Columbo to come over. So Columbo wanders into the house because Margaret left the door unlocked for him. Look at that lovely crocheted granny square blanket. Columbo startles Leslie awake <coughs> and she is slightly distraught as to why he's here. Leslie calls for Margaret, and she comes out high and mighty with a set of keys, claiming these are her father's keys. Margaret starts getting agitated and loud, saying that Leslie killed her father. 
Then Columbo tells Mario to go sit down and has to set something straight with her about these keys. Columbo explains to her that he knows she had the keys duplicated by a locksmith and that foraging evidence is a crime, but he will overlook it this time. Then she jumps up, furious, yelling that she killed her father, and Columbo knows it, while Columbo denies that he knows it. And then... I don't know. Young lady, don't you ever do that again. Columbo, once again, having to lay down the law with these lying, hysterical women. Leslie thanks Columbo for straightening Margaret out, and he replies with a wonderful line. Oh, it was the only thing I could do. I mean, I just can't have you accused of murder on the wrong evidence. I think this little scene between these two is pretty funny. I think you ought to see a doctor, Margaret. I think you're a very sick girl. You listening? Yes, but it's very difficult because I'm so sick. By the way, I don't know why so many people don't care for Margaret in this episode. I mean, just look at her. Well, anyway. This is a great scene transition with the phone ringing and Leslie turning her head. Turns out Columbo's calling. Actually, no, it's not. It's a recording of Columbo. Leslie says she's very busy. What does this have to do with her husband's murder? He explains that her husband could have been dead at the time of the phone call and that his voice was recorded and a timer was set to call her house. Then Leslie shakes her head and begins to summarize Columbo, similarly to how Dr. Ray Fleming summarized him. The humility, the seeming absent-mindedness, homey anecdotes about the family, but it's always the jugular that he's after. She asks, what's the point of this stunt with the phone recording? Did he expect her to fall on the floor confessing? She tells him, either arrest her or get out of here. Then he explains, he's been taken off the case because there's just nothing concrete. There's a murder out in Malibu they want me to look into. Sounds like Leslie's seen the Malibu episode. God, if only I hadn't stopped in town for breakfast or to pick up all these flowers. Look, see for yourself. Then he says goodbye to her, giving her this false sense of relief and freedom. Now we're back at Leslie's house, and she's casually checking the mail, and then... How do you like it, Leslie? Margaret starts having a psychotic episode with a gun filled with blanks. Leslie appears genuinely afraid, with good reason. When Margaret shoots at her a second time, Leslie is sure that there are no real bullets in that gun, and starts running after her. Leslie runs through the house, trying to find Margaret. When she opens the door to her bedroom, down comes the tracking sensor that she threw out of the airplane at the beginning of the episode. On the mirror is some cut and pasted letters like a ransom note, calling Leslie an old bag. Leslie immediately knows to go to the closet, since that's where she hid the bag of money. And there was Margaret, guns blazing in the closet. Leslie yanks her out of there and smacks her in the face, yelling at her to get out of this house. Margaret says she wants her money that was taken for the ransom. Leslie catches on and realizes she wants to negotiate before she goes anywhere. Margaret asks for her cash, and Leslie says, All right, if you're on the plane tomorrow. Here we are at the airport. They say goodbye, and they separate. As Leslie is on her way through the airport, look who just happens to be here reading the paper. Then Leslie invites Columbo to have a drink with her. They sit down to order their drinks, and look at those huge airplanes behind them. Oh, they must have taken off. Oh, there's the airplanes again. I know, I'm being a little nitpicky about the backgrounds. Leslie seems so happy right now. She toasts Columbo, and Columbo references a line from Casablanca. He's looking at you, Mrs. Williams. Then Columbo starts talking about the ransom money, and Leslie's smile starts to fade. Columbo informs her of her lack of conscience, and that is her biggest weakness. Suddenly, Columbo produces the briefcase that Leslie filled with money for Margaret, and Leslie is taken aback. Leslie realizes her defeat and is holding back tears for the rest of the scene. She's been caught. I love this final comical scene here. Columbo's got loads of money in his hands, but not a cent in his pocket. And of course, he doesn't have a pen. This episode is the only one to show the end credits scrolling up the screen and for the background action to continue simultaneously. I think this is an impressive pilot episode. In general, I'm not very negatively critical toward the problems that show up in Columbo. I like to nitpick at the episodes as I go, but when I rate them, it is based on my overall opinion of the episode. And I'll give this episode 5 Columbo cigars out of 5. You could definitely tell a lot of hard work and money went into the ransom for a dead man. We visited several different locations for filming. Leslie was a good and heartless villain. I have a heart. I do. I liked the way they caught her with the ransom money. Columbo's very entertaining, and I was content with all the acting, including Margaret's strangeness. Now, with a final note to my viewers, hopefully I don't get any copyright strike against this video like I did with my prescription murder video. If this video gets blocked too, 
I guess expect it re-uploaded and edited, but I sure hope so much that I don't have to do that again. Thank you for all your kindness in the comments of Prescription Murder. You know, that's very nice of you. Thank you for all my new subscribers. I appreciate your patience with me, and I'm grateful for each and every one of you.